We ended uh, up yesterday and today really talking about how to draw different diagrams for showing how much more, how many more. And she is a little artist, but she wanted to draw a banana spider. Is that I have a sub coming tomorrow. Yo, I have a couple of Teachers Connect questions that I have that I want to respond to today. Hey, hey, what's up guys? I don't know if you could tell from my windows, but it is super dark outside. Um, I've been here for probably about 12 hours, um, but that's because it was a teaching day. Today was Monday, uh, October the 15th. I got here around six o'clock and now it's 6.30, so I've, I've been here literally um, all day. But the reason why is that I have a sub coming tomorrow. Um, and I wanted to make sure that everything was good and everything was perfect. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wanted to make sure that everything, I had everything planned that I wanted to go uh, for tomorrow. So this week we are in math talking about subtracting to compare numbers. So talking about which which group is more, which group is less, and then um, how much more, how much fewer, and things like that. And my kids did really good today. The only thing that we did with math today was just, just tell which one was more and which one was less and what those two words mean. What does it mean to have more? What does it mean to have less? Um, and it went really well with that. Uh, tomorrow, we're not going to do much of math. Um, well, the sub's not going to do much of math because it's our laptop day. So, yay. Um, but... Uh, they will do something with reading. With reading today, our new mentor text this week is Spiders by Gail Gibbons. I, mean, I think I told you guys last week that I wasn't a real big fan of Gail Gibbons just because there was so much information. It's like a overload type thing. But uh, this week, we're taking it piece by piece. Today, we just read the very, very first part of uh, the story, which really talks about generalized um, spiders can be big, spiders can be small. Um, what does that word arachnid mean? Um, and where did it come from? What are the parts of a spider? So we did uh, not, no, no, no. We did a little bit of um, insects and spiders are not the same thing, but tomorrow they're gonna get into parts of a spider. So that's what we did today. And in our uh, reading response journals, we just wrote something that we learned from the book today. Again, we did not read all of the book, but um, I read enough to where somebody could find something to that they could put in their journals. Tomorrow, what they're going to be actually doing is I made this anchor chart um, about parts of a spider. It's actually an anchor chart that I made last year uh, when I was student taught in developmental kindergarten. I used this exact same anchor chart. I just redrew it um, and relabeled some things because we're not doing, we're doing a little bit more than what the other anchor chart was doing. So um, I have the parts of a spider. I have the parts that they have to know. They have to know that it is made of two parts, the head and the abdomen. Um, and then obviously they need to know eyes, legs, which I don't think they have a problem with. But one that I think is going to really mess them up is this one right here, spinnerets. And what they do, that's just what the spiders use to make their uh make their silk and shoot their webs out. But that's what they're gonna be doing tomorrow for reading. And then I went to the library I told you guys about last week um, in last week's vlog. And I got all of these different types of books. And what they're gonna be doing with these and for the rest of this week is they're going to be um, using these books, uh, using the words, using the pictures to find their favorite spider. So um, I have all types of different books. And you have books about brown recluse, books about granddaddy, uh, daddy long leg spiders. I have books about black widow spiders, jumping spiders, hobo spiders, trapdoor spiders, wolf spiders, uh, tarantulas, jumping spiders, spiders in general, spiders that lived with the dinosaurs, the Goliath bird eating spider. Um, so just all types of different spiders. And they're just gonna be looking through. Um, they're gonna be finding their favorite one. They're gonna do two things tomorrow. They're gonna draw it. 
And then they're gonna have to label it with these five labels, head, abdomen, eyes, legs, and spinnerets. So that's what we're gonna be doing with um, reading tomorrow. Um, but we're not gonna do much of any social studies or science tomorrow. There's just gonna be a bunch of, um, a lot of reading, and especially with them having laptops, there's not much that the sub is gonna have to do. That's all I got for today. I will check in with you guys when I come back on Wednesday. What's up, guys? It is Wednesday, October the 17th. Um, I do want to catch you guys up about how my kids did yesterday. So, as you guys know, I talked about it uh, in a clip before this, but I took the day off yesterday just to kind of um, get myself together and just just decompress because I think I've been very, very anxious the past couple of weeks that my mood has just not been its best. So I took a day off yesterday just to kind of get my head in the game and I do feel better today, but I do want to tell you how my kids did yesterday. So, but my kids did fine. Only had one kid absent yesterday and it's so weird because that same child is absent today. So I'm kind of wondering what's going on. Uh, but um, yesterday was a good day. I did have a couple of kids on the clip chart yesterday with a sub that was on red. I had one on red and I had three on orange and then the rest of the class was on yellow. So I'm super excited, super happy about that. Today, I still have a lot of kids on yellow. I have some on orange. I have a couple of that are on green. And the reason why is that one of them was not here today. And then one of my friends had to clip down for um, not being nice to another friend and saying some not nice things. But other than that, everybody still went home on a, on a good color today. So today what we did, um, I'm not sure if I showed you what my post looks like, but I'll show that in a minute. So for math, today we really um, are hitting how much, how many. And I feel like I'm going at a very slow pace, but I'm going at a slow pace because I want my kids to really understand what's going on. So. Monday, we just really looked at different numbers and compared which one is more, which one is less. <clears throat> and then we took that just a bit further today. And I had some problems that were like, there are five children, there are three hats. And then the question would be like, how many do not get hats? So um, it wasn't really asking how many more children are there than, it, than hats, but it was kind of the gist of it. <clears throat> um, so we worked on that and we got out our math toolboxes and used our counters to kind of show here are our five children here are our three hats this one this child has this hat this child has this hat this child has this hat but uh oh these two kids they're missing hats so these are kids that do not get hats um, so we kind of did that and we did different um, equations with those I'm sorry we did different story problems like that and that was where I ended it at. And then tomorrow we're really going to get into how much, how many, and what that means and what that looks like. So I'm super excited for that. I think they're going to rock it out. And then there's also a game on Greg Tang Math that I'm going to introduce. And I'm, I'm actually kind of hesitant on showing it because it is a very hard game. Um, and I'm going to turn you guys around. I'm going to show you what kind of game that is. All right, so this is the game, How Much, How Many on Greg Tang Math and how you play. Um, I'm going to start at level one and we're just going to compare numbers up to five. So I'm going to hit play. And what you do is it's going to time you on how many things you can get. And it's just going to ask you, um, this one give you a picture. It's going to ask you, are there fewer tomatoes or artichokes? Looking at the picture, I can tell that there are fewer artichokes. So I'm going to click on artichokes. And it's going to ask you how many fewer. Well, I know that there are two fewer artichokes than there are tomatoes. So I'm going to put two fewer artichokes. And then it's going to ask you how many vegetables are in all. And I see that there are eight vegetables in all. So I'm going to hit eight. And then I have my answer right there. And then it gives me another one. Um, are there more broccoli or potatoes? Well, I know that there are more broccoli than potatoes. And it's going to ask me, how many more broccoli are there? There's only one more. How many vegetables in all? Seven. Um, and I think it's just going to be very, very difficult. Number one, because it just does not read it to them. Like, my kids need background knowledge. They need to know what are eggplants, what are radishes, 
what are artichokes, what are tomatoes, what are broccoli, what are toma uh, potatoes, what do those look like? Um, so we're going to have to see about that. Um, but I'm still super, super stoked about showing them this game. So we're going to talk about those that word terminology, how much, how many, how much more, how many fewer, and all those different things. Um, whole group first, and then we're going to go to the game whole group, see how that is, and then I will have them work with a partner to see if they can do it together. I don't want them to do it independently, um, no matter if they have it or if they're still struggling with it. I don't want them to do it on their own. I want them to work with a partner to still be able to explain their reasoning and, and tell other people why. I'm really, really big on explaining yourself and making me believe that you are correct in what you're saying. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing with math tomorrow. For reading today, um, it's what they were supposed to do yesterday. Um, my kids had laptop carts yesterday, and I left the sub um, how to get on the laptops, and I left a couple of extra activities. I kind of knew that everything was not going to get done um, just because it is really tedious to get 21 kids on um, laptops when they have their own username, their own password. They have to click on Google, click on the Omnibar, and do all that different things, um, as well as making sure you're spelling things the correct way. Um, the passwords are the dots, so it doesn't really show them how they're spelling it unless they go and click, and they have to click back. And it's just a lot of different things um, that make it a little bit harder for uh, my kids to log on. So. One thing that they uh, were supposed to talk about yesterday were parts of a spider. I did have this in your chart up, but um, it's fine that she didn't get to it. She did let them do spider research with the spider books, which is I am totally okay with. Um, but we just went over the five main parts of a spider. Sorry if I'm moving too much, but we talked about um, the main parts that a spider has. They have a head, an abdomen, legs, eyes and spinnerets and we talked about what spinnerets were what they're used for and then we really got into well do all spiders um make webs because we said that spinnerets are what spiders use to make their webs and we were like well do if we have a trapdoor spider that doesn't use a web do they need spinnerets um you know if they burrow if they live underwater what are some other ways that they can catch their food? They all don't need to use webs, so they all don't need to have spinnerets. So we researched again today, um, really looking at those pictures and zoning in and seeing on these spiders, can we tell what parts the head? Can we tell what parts the abdomen? Can we tell what parts the legs? Can we tell what parts are the eyes and which parts are the spinnerets if our spider has spinnerets? So... I do want to show you what some of the kids had. Um, they're so cute. Um, this one, <laughs> uh, and she is a little artist, but she wanted to draw a banana spider. Um, and this is her banana spider with the eyes, the legs, the head, the spinnerets, and the spinnerets are shooting out webs to make the web. And you see that she's catching flies with it. So uh, they had a really good time with being able to make their own spider and be able to label them. Now, obviously, I will have some that are just very precious. Um, but overall, they did really good. This is one of the um, water spiders that lives in water. Um, she did not be uh, finish labeling, but I'll let her finish that tomorrow. And then we just have one more. And then this is a black widow that someone did and they wanted to draw themselves beside it. Um, but still they got their spider. He doesn't have enough legs. I'm gonna have to tell him about that tomorrow. But um, at least he labeled it correctly. He got the abdomen, he got the spinnerets, he got the eyes, he has the head, he has the legs. So he knows what the parts are. He doesn't have enough of one of the parts. But that's what we did for our reading today. Um, is doing that tomorrow what we're going to do is we're going to talk about main idea and key details and make a spider out of that i'm super excited about how that's going to go um for phonics and language we talked about ing as our sound we talked we found ing in different words we came up with words i'm super proud because one of my kids they thought of 
Pringles that has the ing sound in it. So I'm telling you, man, these kids are funny. Um, for social studies this week, we're still talking about cardinal directions. Um, you can compass rows. We're also still talking about Christopher Columbus. We are talking about um, Christopher Columbus, how he made it to the Bahamas. We talked about how there were people already there. And um, does that mean that he found new land or is it just new to him? I'm going to sit down because I know that some of you guys say when I walk around, it makes you dizzy. So I'm going to sit back down. Um, but they had some really good points on whether we should still celebrate Columbus Day or not. For science this week, we are talking about seasons and uh, sunrise and sunset and how that changes. So really just the length of uh, the time of day and things like that. How we have longer days in the summer and shorter nights. And in the winter time, it's opposite. We have shorter days and longer nights. So that's pretty much it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to check the rest of my friends' spiders and make sure that they uh, labeled correctly. After that, I'm going to get some things copied and cut and ready for tomorrow so I don't have to worry about it. And then after that, other than that, I think that's what I'm going to do today. So I'm going to check out and I will catch you guys tomorrow to let you know how tomorrow went. All right, guys. See ya. What's up, guys? It is Friday. October the 19th. I it is six o'clock and I was talking to with another teacher um, and we ended up talking for a long time but uh, I do want to really quick talk to you guys about the rest of this week how it went. So for math this week we ended uh, up yesterday and today really talking about how to draw different diagrams for showing how much more how many more or um how much fewer how many fewer um using our one-to-one -one matching so matching them up and finding the answer or using the tape diagram which is what our program um uses to you to do how much more how many more um we took our test today on that after we reviewed they did great um i did notice though if there were any that were missed it wasn't because they couldn't um do the one to one they couldn't match it up it was that after they matched it up instead of finding how many more how many less they added all of them together um which i totally understand but we've got to, i told them that you know these words are going to trick you you're going to think if it says in all or if it doesn't if it doesn't say in all we're not adding them together um if it says if it has those words how much more or how many fewer or anything like that that's where we know we need to line them up, try and see which ones don't have those matches and do it that way. But other than that, my kids did great. One thing that we did yesterday and today also uh, for reading, we are working on main idea and key details. We've been doing main idea and key details for about a month and a half now. And what we did today was we made main idea or main topic spiders. So... What we did was with our book, Gail G uh, Spiders by Gail Gibbons, what we did was we read through the book. We talked about some different um, facts about spiders from the book. We talked about what, what those mean as far as key details and what they relate back to. So yesterday and today, they were put into groups. And yesterday, all they had to do was find key details about our main topic. We've been talking about what's the main topic of the story. We've been talking about that, talking about it, talking about it, talking about talking about it until the cows come home. So we already knew our main topic. What we did yesterday was um, going through the story to find key details. So we read through yesterday, not the whole book, but maybe like the first two or three pages. And as we're reading it, I'm telling them, is this a key detail? Is this something that um, supports our main topic? Um, does it talk about our main topic? Is it relevant? Um, is this something that people might want to know about spiders or is this something interesting that people should know about spiders or anything, just different things like that. So the first two or three pages, we worked on finding key details together and together we found four. Um, one was there are 30,000 different kinds of spiders. Spiders can be as big as a dinner plate. 
spiders lived before dinosaurs, and spiders are not insects. Those are four that we found together. Now, once I got in the groups, I told them, if you guys want to use those key details, use them. We found these together. They're not just mine. We found them together. They're the whole classes. So if you and your partner want to use those key details, then use them. Now, half of them did not want to use any of the key details that we found together, which is fine. But what they had to do was I gave them, I gave each group uh, strips of paper like this. And this was going to be the spider's legs. All they had to do was find key details that are related back to the topic and just write it on this, on this strip of paper. So we worked on that yesterday. We also finished it up today and then put our spiders together. And this is kind of the main topic that we had. Um, so if you look in the middle on the body, we have main topic, spiders, and then on each leg, we have a different key detail. If you look, one says, uh, most spiders don't stay with their babies. Um, the orb weaving spider spins a pattern web. Um, some spiders live in water. Some spiders hide in flowers. Girl spiders can eat boy spiders. Spiders live before the dinosaurs. Spiders are not insects and... Spiders can be as big as a dinner plate. So those are just facts that they came up with together. Um, key details that they found together to use for that. Um, so that shows uh, great, great work with that. I'm super proud of them. Um, for science and social studies, we did not hit a lot on that today. Um, just because we had a lot of different things going on. We had our fun Friday today. We also had a golden lunchbox dance, which the golden lunchbox is our cafeteria incentive uh, for good behavior in the cafeteria. So for any students who showed great behavior in the cafeteria, they got to go to our golden lunchbox dance, which um, I was put in charge of finding the music for. Now, I will say I was very um, nervous just because I wasn't sure of what music to put together. Um, would the kids like it? Is it appropriate or anything, anything like that? Um, one thing I do want to ask on Teachers Connect this week is, what songs do you guys play in the classroom? What songs do you deem as appropriate to listen to in the classroom? Um, I do play a lot of kids' bop songs. I do try to play the real versions if I can. Um, if I can edit out uh, some inappropriate parts, I'll edit out those parts, but still play the 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 normal song with with it edited. Um, but yeah, I'm just really interested in what you put in your classroom playlist. Um, what I put in mine, what I ended up doing was I ended up making two different playlists. Um, for the kindergarten through second grade dance, I just did a lot of kids bop. Um, so we did uh, the kids bop version of Cardi B's song, I Like It, um, Juju on that beat. Um, now that I'm trying to think of them, my, it escapes my mind. But I did a lot of kids' bop versions of songs. For the older kids, I wanted to make sure that, you know, it it was the uh, original song. It was by the artist. But I also had to make sure that their words in it were appropriate. And that's kind of hard just because even though it might not have, like, explicit cursing, I don't want to have any... Um, innuendos or any um, words that could mean something inappropriate. So that was the hardest thing for me. A couple of songs that I know I put on there for that one was um, The Middle by DJ Snake, I think. Um, I did put it um, just because it is just a craze right now, but the uh, in My Feelings by Drake, you know, the Kiki, do you love me? Um, I put that in there, but that is one that I edited. I did only the chorus, um, and I did it back to back, and then I ended the song. It wasn't um, anything strenuous with that other than the Kiki, do you love me part. But those are just some things that I put in mind. So I want to know, what are some songs that you guys deem as classroom appropriate? What I'm going to do is... Now, I'm going to go home because it is 6.10, and I definitely did not plan on staying here past 4. Um, but I'm going to go home. I'm going to answer some Teachers Connect questions, and then that will be it. So I will see you in the next clip. 
All right, guys, it's about that time to wrap up this video. I have a couple of Teachers Connect questions that I have that I want to respond to today. Um, really quick, Teachers Connect, if you don't know, is an online platform where teachers are able to collaborate with each other, ask different questions, um, bounce ideas off of each other, and just be able to collaborate with teachers not only um, in your state, not only in your city, not only in the United States, but across the entire world. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. All right, so the first question comes from Latanya from Smarty Style, and she says this question is for elementary school teachers. Uh, do you find that science and social studies get pushed to the side all in the name of spending more time on the tested subjects like math and language arts? Um, and my answer to that, uh, without a doubt, is absolutely yes, all the time, <laughs> every day. At my school, we do a lot with um, math, reading, and language arts. We have whole group teaching. We have small group teaching. We have intervention where kids are getting pulled out. But I feel like all the time there's just not enough um, hours in the school day to get everything pushed in. And um, and one thing about it is that it's really sad to me just because when we do discuss science and social studies topics, the kids are really into it. And, and they really seem like they enjoy those type of topics um, a lot more than they do math or um, ELA. But um, for me, it's a definite yes. Um, and looking at some of the other responses from other people on Teachers Connect, I'm not the only one that feels that way. Um, there is one person, um, Tracy, who says that that rarely happens at her school. Um, they have a subject called General Studies where they teach history, geography, and the other four sciences of biology, chemistry, physical science. And I'm thinking the other one's physics, but I'm not sure. Uh, they say each term, it covers a single learning area, and everything is covered over a two-year cycle. Um, and the school mandates time allotment for the general studies, so that's pretty awesome. Other than that one comment, everyone else is kind of um, in the same boat as me as far as it. sometimes we don't get to it, and we just put it in when we can. Um, I did also say that I do try to integrate it into the other subjects like reading and language arts, but... With our curriculum and how it's set and what we're teaching and when we're teaching it, it is kind of hard to plug that in. So um, I try to plug it in whenever I can. And then other times I try to pull out maybe like 20, 25 minutes at the end of the day to kind of pull some things in there. But that's my, my response for that. Um, and then there's one more uh, question that I want to respond to. It's from Anonymous. <clears throat> and this question says... Um, how do you best work with a kid that is always argumentative over everything? Having them do work is a struggle because she just wants to talk to her friends or play with knickknacks from their book bag. When I confront her, it's always a groan or she tries to argue with me. What do you suggest? Um, and I'm going to read you guys verbatim what I said just because I feel like what I said was it was to the point, but I also gave some good insight, I believe. So <laughs> what I said was, um, as far as distracting others, I always rem remind my students that the first part of school is to learn and that I won't let anyone take away um, from someone else's learning. So I do have four students in my class at this time who um, habitually choose to talk to and distract other kids when it's time to work at their table groups. So what I did was I created islands, um, and I got this actually from a team, uh, someone on my team. But it's just an, it's just a desk, um, and it's against the wall, and it's to themselves, they're not near anyone, so that way they can't distract other friends. So, um, and when they have no one near them to distract them, um, they kind of have no choice but to do their work. Um, because they see everyone else already sitting at their desk doing their work. Um, and it's kind of like, well, I have nothing else to do but to do my work. So it kind of puts it on them to do that. I mean, I also said, as far as playing with things in their backpack, um, we have backpack hooks in my classroom, and they're uh, on the other side of one of the walls, so they're not even seen once you put them away and come into the classroom. So I don't have a thing with that. I'm not sure if your kids keep their backpacks at their seats or what, but mine don't, so I don't have that problem. I also don't let my kids take out toys or anything. If they bring a toy, it stays in their backpack. I don't want to see it. If I see it, it's mine until you go home. And that's just, it is what it is. Um... And then um, also said that those islands that are in my classroom, uh, the part of the desk where you can like stick things in, 
We don't use that in my classroom. I turn that desk around and that inside part faces the wall so they can't even access the inside of a desk. Um, we have a lot of shelving in my classroom where we put our supply boxes in certain things. We put our, um, I keep their reading journal so that, so that way it keeps me more accountable to check their work and things like that when I turn it in. Um, our workbooks I keep on a shelf so they really don't have any need to use the inside of their desk so those just get turned around and put to the wall so no need for that um and then i also said lastly um my kids all know that the groaning the moaning the whining it does not affect me i do not care it does not make me sad it it just it is what it is um and i always tell them you have two options you can either complete your work now when you're supposed to or if you want to whine and moan and groan that's fine i'm just going to walk away and when you're ready to stop and actually get your work done, then you can do that. Um, and most of the time that works, I do have one that is a little stubborn and he'll choose to just sit and look at me with a mad face. And I'll just look right back at him like, okay, that's fine. If you want to sit and pout, that's fine. But I do also pull him to the side and be like, okay, this is what you're choosing to do, which means you're also choosing to do your work during your free time. And that's completely your choice. I'm not forcing you to do it. I'm not telling you you have to do that. I'm just saying you can either do your work now or do your work during your free time. And since you're choosing to not do your work now, you are also choosing to take your free time to do your work. Um, and sometimes that works for him and sometimes it doesn't. And then he'll just have to go on his merry little way and do his work during his free time. But I always try to give them a little bit of ownership in their learning um, I don't want to um, force my hand on what I want them to do. I always give them choices, but it's always going to um, steer them in the right direction. Um, with those choices, they're always going to get there. They are going to have um, the option to either finish uh, to finish it now or finish it later. But at the end of the day, it's going to get finished. Um, but other than that, that's what I said. Um, someone else said it has to do with how expectations have been set up. Um, for example, my kiddos know that the right to learn is one of my highest priorities. So they know that when they're mucking around, I will protect others' rights to learn. That's the language I use in my classroom. I have a spot where kids can work with less ability to distract. Those are my islands. Um, so yeah, we have some good things. She says, as for the morning and groaning, be direct and be consistent. If it were one of my students, I would take them aside and ask them about that particular behavior. I would then explain that how their behavior is being experienced when you oh then i would explain how their behavior is being experienced for example when you do that it makes me feel like you are disrespecting me and that is unacceptable i would then lay out a plan for going forward and where the behavior continues it'll be a consequence so kind of like what i said um brian says that he had tried two strategies um, that have helped him out. One strategy is to leave a directive written post-it note on the student's desk and then walk away. And then the second one is to give some time for students to do it, AKA, by the end of the center, please put your toy away. This stops the power struggle and gives some leeway for the student. Avoiding that power struggle is always my aim. And then James says, they're all great answers. You could also try a technique called 210, two times 10. Spend two minutes a day with her for 10 days in a row right after class and just talk slash listen about non-school related stuff. Get to know her. Her behavior will change. And then there's someone else named Jonathan who put a uh, suggestion about reading the book Conscious Classroom Management by Rick Smith. He calls the behavior you describe arguing with the ref, and he has good ideas for mitigating it. The book is wonderful. Awesome. But those are some responses that Anonymous got, um, as well as my own response for that. If you guys have any responses for those questions, make sure you get on Teachers Connect and uh, leave those responses for those teachers. I know they would love to have them. If you don't have a Teachers Connect account and you want to, uh, look in the description box below. I have a link in there for you can sign up. Uh, other than that, thank you guys for joining me in this video. Thank you for sticking with me to the end. And I will... <clears throat> other than that, that's all I have for you. Um, thank you so much for watching this video and sticking with me to the end. And I will catch you in the next video. See you guys.